Good morning, everybody. Uh, We are in Ephesians chapter 4. If you would want to open your Bibles to that passage, continuing our study of the book of Ephesians. You know, would you... uh, Would you believe me uh, this morning if I told you I was Superman? (laughs) Well, that settles it. You know, maybe even if I took off my disguise here, you know, uh, you could see it more clearly. Now, you'd probably have reasons to doubt that, right? Uh, One thing would be the lack of muscles uh, up here. But, But in fact, it would be reasonable for you to ask for me to prove a claim like that, right? Uh, you would probably like to see me jump a building in a single bound or, or uh, stop a speeding locomotive or shoot lasers out of my eyes or something like that. Because when it comes to identity, it, it's not enough just to talk the talk. Uh, you must walk the walk. And that's true about the Christian life as well. And that's kind of where we find ourselves in the book of Ephesians here in chapter 4. For the first three chapters, Paul has been describing that identity that we have in Jesus Christ. And here in chapter 4, he's going to begin to describe how to live out that identity. How to walk the walk of the Christian life. Because it's not enough to claim that you are a Christian. You also need to show it in how you live. And in the passage we're going to look at today, as you may have figured out by the theme of the, uh, the worship music that we've had this morning, we're going to look at that first characteristic of the worthy walk of the Christian life. And that is the concept of unity. It's unity. A believer who is walking the walk should be striving for unity within the body of Christ. And Paul calls this unity in the passage that we're looking at today, the unity of the Spirit. So let's see what he says about it here in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And here's verse 3 is sort of the central idea of this passage. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, It's your gift to us by the Spirit. And we would ask that you would be so gracious to have your spirit also open the eyes of our hearts to it so that we might receive it in faith. And we ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. So Paul here is basically saying here at the beginning of chapter 4 that we as believers are obligated to maintain the unity of the spirit. That main idea there in verse 3. And I want us to make special note of that word maintain. That word maintain. We are called to maintain this unity, not to create the unity. The Holy Spirit is the one who creates the unity of the body of Christ. And then we are obligated then to do our part to maintain it. It works like this. When we respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ in faith, the Spirit creates this unity by uniting us to Jesus Christ by placing us in the body of Christ, establishing a spiritual union that each of us has with Jesus and with each other. And if you're going to compare this to sports, we would say that the Spirit is the one then that places you on this team. He clothes you in Jesus Christ. You are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That's your new team jersey, so to speak, that the Spirit has placed on you. And you're on that team whether you like it or not. You don't try out for the team. You, uh, you, were, you were placed on it by the Spirit. And so you have a couple of choices. Either, either you're going to be a good teammate who, who keeps that unity of the Spirit, 
who does his or her part to help the, the team stay unified and for the team to function, for the body of Christ to function. Or you are an indifferent teammate who, who cares little about this unity that the Spirit has created. As I quoted from Joni Erickson Tata, the, the well-known Christian author and speaker a couple of weeks ago about this topic, she says that believers are never told to become one. We are one, and we're expected to act like it. And so how do, we, how do we maintain this unity of the Spirit here that Paul is talking about? Well, basically, he describes two commitments that you must make if you want to maintain this unity of the Spirit, the unity of the body of Christ. And he calls this unity a unity of the bond of peace. It's a bond of peace in verse 3. And if this bond of peace was like a belt that was holding the body of Christ together, then these two commitments that we're going to look at today are like the buckle and the clasp of that belt. They sort of secure this unity together. And so we see the first necessary commitment in verse 2 that we must make to keep unity. And that's where Paul points out that we maintain the unity of the Spirit, first of all, through a commitment to Christ-like character. Through a commitment to, Christ, to a Christ-like character. And Paul in that verse there, in verse 2, lists a series of Christ-like character traits. Humility. And I think all the rest of the traits that we see there are really grounded in that idea of humility. Patience. Gentleness, meaning restrained power. A person who demonstrates gentleness is, is not given to volatility, not given to flying off the handle and then bearing with one another in love. And I, I would argue that these are Christ-like character traits that we are called to put on in the Christian life. These are fruit of the Holy Spirit, so to speak. These are the traits, as we saw last week, that we should be going to God going to the throne of grace so that he, by a work of the Holy Spirit, can strengthen us with inner power in order to live out those traits so that Christ may dwell in our hearts richly. And so, so why, does, why does Paul say that we should put on these traits? Well, I think it's obvious, but I'll, I'll mention the obvious anyway. It's because that anyone who is, who is demonstrating the character of Christ will not be causing division within the body. They won't be seeking controversy within the body. Anyone who's manifesting the character of Christ will not be prone to pettiness or, or grudge holding, things that typically cause division among the body. In Philippians chapter 2, if you want to make your way there in your Bibles, Paul uh, gently addresses a developing point of division among the believers in the church in Philippi. And at the center of this kind of burgeoning controversy, there, there were two women, one named Euodia and one named Syntyche. We're never told what the conflict was between the two women, whether it was a power struggle of some sort, we don't know. But evidently, whatever their issue was, it was immaterial. Paul doesn't address the issue that they were having. But we can read his prescription for the problem there in the church, that division, and how they should maintain the unity of the Spirit. Philippians chapter 2, uh, beginning, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit... Any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, and do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others." And so have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. So what is the prescription for unity within the church? It's to take on the humility of Christ. And something tells me that the much of the division that we see in the visible church today would be eliminated if we could just accept an ounce of the humility that the Son of God demonstrated in letting go of the glory of an eternal heaven to take on the form of a man and then to be a servant at that. Christ like believers do not tear at the unity of the Spirit. They keep it. Now he probably doesn't like me mentioning this. You know, but Pastor Mark is a trained mediator. And uh, he's been called into various churches over the years to, to sort of mediate different divisions and splits and things like that that were going on within local bodies. And I could remember him making a statement probably a couple of years ago about this that just really stuck to me and spoke to me about this topic. He said, I've never experienced a problem within a church that just a dime's worth of Christianity could fix or couldn't fix. And so perhaps if, if we found ourselves in a point of conflict with another believer, the first question we ought to ask ourselves ought to be, am I manifesting the character of Christ in this situation? Especially, am I, am I attempting to put on his humility? If not, I, I need to go to the throne of grace to get the strength that is needed to do so. And at that point, I really have two options whenever I'm sort of in a conflict with another believer. I, I can go to that person and I can begin to solve that problem in a Christ-like way. Or I can choose to overlook their offense and bear with them in love in a Christ-like way. And so the first commitment to keep the unity of the Spirit is to demonstrate the character of Christ within the body. I mean, that is the goal of our Christian lives anyway, right? We should be becoming more, becoming more Christ-like as we progress in our faith. Second commitment we see to keep the unity of the Spirit is in verses 4 through 6. And this is where Paul basically says that we also maintain the unity of the Spirit through a commitment not only to Christ-like character, but to truth. We maintain a, the unity of the Spirit through a commitment to truth. And Paul there in verses 4 through 6 is describing the great truths or the great realities of the Christian faith. And he even divides these up into a Trinitarian format. I tell you, if you look for it, the Trinity is all over the New Testament. Verse 4 speaks to the truths that are related to the Holy Spirit. Verse 5 talks about the truths related to God the Son, Jesus Christ. And then in verse 6, he talks about God the Father. And I think I'm probably saying the obvious here, but, but Scripture alone reserves the right to define and fully articulate these truths to us. So if we want to know what these truths are, we have to go to Scripture to find out. They define the truths. And even though this is a short list of truths in this, these uh, three verses here, as you consider them, they really cover a lot of territory. Let's take a look at them really quickly. Paul says there's one body, referring to the truth about the church. What is the church? We've been talking about that a lot in Ephesians already. How is it formed? What, what is its purpose? How should the church be organized? All those things related to that one body. Then there's one spirit referring to the Holy Spirit. Who is he? What does he do? What is his role among the members of the Trinity? Then there is, according to Paul, one hope to which we are called to by the Holy Spirit. And this hope, according to 1 Peter, is a living hope and in a glorious future inheritance guaranteed by the resurrection of Christ. There's one Lord, he says 
Who is this Lord? Who is Jesus? What has he done? What is he continuing to do? What will he do in the future? There's one faith. And we're not talking about faith bracket here. Okay? We're, we're talking about the body of teachings that have been given to us by Christ and his apostles that comp uh, comprise what it is we must believe. It's the body of teachings. And at the center of those teachings is, is, is the most important truth, which is the gospel. The message of Jesus Christ, who he is, and his death for sin and resurrection. The one faith. Then there's one baptism. I do believe Paul's referring to water baptism, the ceremony that publicly identifies a believer with Jesus Christ and identifies him with Christ's church. Then there's one father, he says, who is father over the children of God, sovereignly at work in our lives, working all things for good according to Romans 8. And Paul is saying that those are the truths of the Christian faith that need to be agreed over in order to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Any unity that is maintained at the expense of those truths is actually a false unity. And not only is it artificial, it is dangerous to try to create a so-called Christian unity while rejecting those truths. And you, you see this priority in the purity of the truth before you establish unity in a statement that James makes in the book of James. Where he says, but wisdom from above is first pure. And then secondly, peaceable. The purity of the truth must be clung to in order for there to be genuine unity. Think of these truths here that Paul laid down in these verses as though they were fences or boundaries. Genuine unity of the Spirit can only take place within those boundaries, is what Paul is saying. And if you're a rancher, if you're, if you're like Austin, or if you're like Paul, you know how important it is to, to set up and to tend to good fences, right? I mean, without a well-tended fence, thing, your, 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 your cattle or your, or your sheep are going to wander off. Or even worse, wolves or coyotes are going to wander in. And they're going to help themselves to dinner, right? So it is with these boundaries that Paul has laid down for us within which to keep the unity. But you know, that's not how evangelicals approach unity anymore. The approach nowadays is to, to downplay truth in order to have unity. And so as a result, we've, we've sort of torn down or renegotiated some of these old boundaries, some of these old truths. Because after all, isn't the truth and clinging to truth way too dogmatic? Shouldn't we just unite over feelings? Shouldn't we just sort of unite over shared experiences and and, and, and preferences and that sort of thing. You know, we're sort of like that Nike ad. I don't know if you've seen that new Nike ad uh, that's come out recently. It has uh, Colin Kaepernick on it. Have you seen that, that ad with Colin Kaepernick? What's the slogan to that ad? Well, that's Nike's slogan, just do it. But, but on that ad it says, believe anything. And then sacrifice everything. Really? Tell that to the survivors of Jonestown. Believe anything. You know, that may be a catchy slogan, but that's a horrible way to approach the truth. And yet it seems like an apt description of, of where we are as a church today. And evangelicalism. And... There, there are lots of polls that have been out recently uh, taken among self-professed Christians that, that indicate this. You know, the Lifeway and Ligonier poll that came out a couple years ago um, asking evangelicals questions like, well, who's Jesus? Well, I, I, think, he's a, I think he's like the, the first created being, isn't he? Right? Um, a little higher than the angels maybe? He's a great guy. God, I, I don't know if he's God or not. 
Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit? You know, is it it's like this force? Kind of like Star Wars force? I kind of I kind of tune this little knob over here and I kind of dial in, you know, to feel what he's saying or what this inanimate force is doing? What about the Trinity? Well, we think there's one God, but he kind of runs around in human history masquerading as someone different all the time. In the Old Testament, he was this guy called the Father. Kind of angry. And then, then, he, then he came to earth as the Son in Jesus Christ. And then he went away and he came back as the Spirit. What about the Gospel? Well, isn't that where if I'm good enough? That God's going to allow me into heaven? I mean, that's, that's where we're going. We, we, we've, we've taken down those old markers, those old established truths for the sake of unity oftentimes. And we've become a people who don't know what we believe and why we believe it. And this is showing up in large amounts of young people who are abandoning, abandoning the evangelical faith. They're becoming this growing category of people called the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S. They're not becoming Catholic nuns, they're becoming N-O-N-E-S nuns. No affiliation. There's a, there's a great, uh, actually great article on Pastor Mark's uh, Facebook page if you want to find that. I think, didn't you post that this week? about that growing category of, of young people? Yeah, we, we've got quite a cultural pundit here. You know, you need to be tapping into what he's saying on his Facebook. But this article is saying that, you know, there, there are people that are abandoning the faith, these young people, because they don't understand how the faith can be intellectually defensible. How it is that you can intellectually claim to be a Christian in the world marketplace of ideas, but you don't understand that that's what we're saying. We are Christians because we believe it all to be true. It is the truth that, that arises above all the other claims at the truth. You know, I've learned this lesson the hard way. Of course, this, uh, you know, this has been a whole three years of you know, trying to learn to be a pastor with training wheels. Um, how important it is to create unity within the truth. You know, just this last year we had a, uh, an organization outside of our church that said, hey, would you like to partner with us in some gospel ministry in Colby, Kansas? I said, yeah, absolutely. I, I want my people getting gospel dirt under their fingernails in this community that needs the gospel, absolutely. And, and so I said, yeah, we'll, we'll support you. And we, we did support them in a kind of a secondary role. But later, come to find out, you know, when, when we talked about the gospel, we didn't mean the same thing. Uh, their gospel was, well, Jesus is kind of like this wonderful divine therapist. He's, he's like the greatest boyfriend ever that's going to be there for you. He loves you. And all you have to do is, is just come to him and he's going to fix your problems. He's there for you. And I don't like being controversial, guys. I don't. I'm like a milk toast. I'm a weenie. I don't like disagreeing with people. But didn't Paul say... 1 Corinthians 15, that the gospel is Jesus came, he died for sin, and he rose again. Am I wrong? But see, that's one of those boundaries. That's one of those established markers of truth within which genuine unity of the Spirit can only take place. Because there's no true unity of the Spirit apart from these, or a commitment to these essential truths. Because the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth after all, right? 
by Jesus in John chapter 16? And so the question is, do you know what you believe and why you believe it? Now, I'm not saying you have to be dogmatic to the point of being rude and mean. But do you know where you shouldn't cross a boundary and call it Christian unity when it comes to these truths? Well, Paul has laid down several of them, I think, here that we can use as our standard. Because if you don't know what you believe and why you believe it, there's a lot of people out there that are willing to sell you a bridge in Brooklyn. You know, in closing uh, this morning, I'd like to challenge each of us to consider what it is that we could do personally to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Whether it's, you know, there's a growing division between myself and another believer and I need to consider how, how it is that I need to manifest the character of Christ in that situation. Or maybe it's, I need to understand these truths a little better uh, so that I, I know what the genuine boundaries are from within which Christian unity can exist. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you uh, that your spirit has placed us in unity. And uh, so much of what we sang about and even talked about this morning, even in Sunday school, about that unity is sweet. It's a, it's a new family, a new group of people that, that care for us. And I pray, Father, that you would make us eager to maintain that unity. And we ask all these things. In the name of your Son, Jesus, amen.